All right. Um, a very good morning to everybody. And um, so we're starting off the session on early stage lung cancer. Uh, we'll begin with mediastinal evaluation in early lung cancer. Uh, I'm Devyani Niyogi. I'm a thoracic surgeon from the Tata Memorial Hospital in Mumbai. Uh, since this is we're kickstarting the session with this talk, uh, let's begin with what exactly do we characterize as early lung cancer? So according to the AJCC uh, staging, uh, which is the eighth edition that we're currently using, Anything that is T1, T2, or N1, N2 is early lung cancer. That means any tumor which is up to 4 centimeter in size or node negative, at the most hilar node positive. These are the ones that come under early. So if we've already decided that they're early lung cancer on imaging, why do we need to stage the mediastinum? It is basically to detect the radiologically occult N2 and N3 nodes. Lung cancer staging mainly involves these three things. You would have done a tissue diagnosis to arrive at your diagnosis, a PET scan for a whole body staging, and an MRI brain to look for any brain metastasis. After all of this, why stage the mediastinum? So the answer to this question lies in the table on the top left. So first of all, only 15 or 20% of lung cancer actually presents in the early or loco-regional stage. And if you notice the circle numbers uh, on the last column, the survival drops precipitously, almost by half, once the lymph nodes become involved. So the nodal status actually determines the treatment options and the prognosis of the patient. It significantly affects the patient's survival. And despite all kind of staging that we do, 12.5% of the times we are still caught unawares with N2 disease. As you can see the uh, survival curves on the right, the red line is N1 node. The green line, which the survival drops pretty precipitously, is the N2 nodal status involvement. Are there any patients where that much of staging with PET CT and MRI is enough? Can we avoid mediastinal staging? So mediastinal staging in lung cancer is actually a rule. The only exception being peripheral lung tumors, which are in the outer one third of the lung fields and T1 tumors, that is tumors less than three centimeters in size, and node negative at the hilum and mediastinum on the PET scan. So your tumor has to fulfill all these three criteria for us to safely say that no invasive mediastinal staging is required in this case. So why is PET CT not enough? All other cancers, we do a PET scan and that's the end of staging. The reason is, as Dr. Nilendu will also clarify in his talk, that PET CT in lung cancer is prone to a lot of both false positives as well as false negatives. So when we analyzed our series at TMH with lymph nodes with SUV uptake of more than four, which in any cancer would be considered as fairly significant, in lung cancer, the false positive was seen in 18% of the time. That is in one in five patients, we risked upstaging the patient if we only depended on the PET scan for the mediastinal nodal status. The reason for that is India is a country which is endemic for TB and for granulomatous disease. So even the nodes which are affected by granulomas or TB can look as hot nodes on a PET scan and may end up upstaging your patient quite significantly. The other end of the spectrum is the false negative which is due to the shine through effect of organs in the mediastinum, which all have pretty high uptake on a PET scan. And so you don't end up seeing the hot nodes, which risks to understage your patient and you end up giving less treatment than you would actually the patient would deserve. Which is why we come to invasive mediastinal staging. There are two ways to do it. One is the endobronchial ultrasound with an endosonography through the esophagus, which is called EUSD. And the second is the mediastinoscopy. So the EBUS is a relatively new kid on the block. It's way less invasive than a mediastinoscopy. It's done under conscious sedation. And all the guidelines recommend it as the initial step in invasive mediastinal staging. If it is associated, you have a pathologist on site who gives you a rapid on site examination. It improves the accuracy of your EBUS and also hastens the results. It is associated with absolutely negligible complications. Mediastinoscopy is the gold standard for invasive mediastinal staging. It's a surgical procedure done under general anesthesia. You could have a standard mediastinoscope where you peer in through the mediastinoscope into the mediastinum, or what is more done today is the video mediastinoscopy, where the image is projected onto a screen. 
and the false negative rate being the gold standard is as low as 2%. Although it is associated with a few complications in 6%, we'll come to that subsequently. So these are the ISLC nodal stations. EBUS and mediastinoscopy can pretty much well assess your levels 2 and 4 on both sides, as well as a subcarinal nodal station 7. EBUS, in addition, can also evaluate stations 10 and 11, that is the hyla and the interlobar nodes. The mediastinoscopy, if you push it a little in front of the left main bronchus, can also get you to level 5. But having said all this, for both EBUS and mediastinoscopy, the blind spots still remain stations 5 and 6. When we put the EBUS scope through the esophagus, we can also access stations 8 and 9. So our true blind spots in the mediastinum remain station 5 and station 6. So this is the genesis of EBUS. These were the three seminary papers that came up on this as early as 2004. And if you see the authors, be it Yasufuku or Anima, all of these were thoracic surgeons. So basically, EBUS, though being an endobronchial procedure, was a thoracic surgeon's brainchild. And the early results itself from these centers were extremely impressive. If you see the sensitivity and the specificity, they almost approach that of the gold standard that is mediastinoscopy, and this was way back in 2004. But the question remains, are these fantastic results reproducible? As with any sonographic technique, even EBUS is operator dependent. It is associated with a significant learning curve. And single center experiences started reporting false negative rates of as high as 20%, which is a very high price to pay when you think about lung cancer. This was shown in a randomized control trial, which is called the ASTA trial, which showed, pitched the combination of EBUS and mediastinoscopy on one side, as again surgical staging with a mediastinoscopy on the other. And what they found that the sensitivity of an EBUS combined with a mediastinoscopy was a phenomenal 94%. And it brought down the futile thoracotomy rates from 18% to 7%. So the ASTA trial was actually the background and the basis for the ESTS to come up with their 2014 guideline, which is still the latest version. So even in 2022, we are following the 2014 guideline, which says that if your PET scan shows no mediastinal nodes, then any one of the two techniques is enough for you to complete your invasive mediastinal staging. But if the PET scan shows suspicious looking nodes, you start with an EBUS. If the EBUS comes negative, it is mandatory to confirm it with a mediastinoscopy. So let's see the journey that EBUS has traversed from 2004 till today in 2022. The false negative rates in most centers that are performing EBUS have become better and better. They're inching closer to the gold standard that is mediastinoscopy. The sensitivity and specificity, especially from some of the series that are reported from South Korea, are 88% and 100%, which are actually better than mediastinoscopy and they're associated with almost no complications. So it's becoming more and more attractive. One paper that came out recently that we should know about is the SCORE study, which said that a systematic nodal sampling, where you diligently go into each station, check the nodes, and any node more than 5 mm gets sampled, actually gives better results than a selective strategy where you only target the PET-positive nodes. So in today's day and age, is a confirmatory mediastinoscopy mandatory? Why not? Because all the studies that have studied this showed that the limited additional nodal met that was picked up with a mediastinoscopy was actually not that significant. The morbidity was something to think about. Not to mention the treatment cost and the delay because you're doing two procedures only to stage the mediastinum. And the micrometastatic N2, which were additionally picked up by the mediastinoscopy, had a questionable impact on survival. So Bosima is a big name in mediastinal staging. He did a meta-analysis which said that the unforeseen N2 rate was around 9%, whether or not you confirmed your negative EBUS with a mediastinoscopy. Moreover, mediastinoscopy has a 6% morbidity, including recurrent palsies and chyle leaks. And this unforeseen N2 in this 9%, when they followed it up over time, actually had no impact on survival. So you have the Mediast trial, which is currently ongoing. It is just about completing accrual which will help us answer this question with some evidence backing. Can we forego a mediastinoscopy after negative EBUS? But a mediastinoscopy or a VAMLA, that is a video-assisted mediastinoscopic lymphadenectomy, is not completely obsolete. 
what it helps the surgeon do is it helps them assess the resectability of the nodes it gives you a very good clearance for left sided tumors because the arch aorta comes in the way when you try to clear left sided nodes by a wats or a, a thoracotomy approach the morbidity is acceptable it's a palsy rate of 2.4% that we are looking at and the most attractive thing is the surgeon is enough so we don't have to depend on anybody else or any other procedure to stage the mediastinum it can be timed at the same time as the resection of the primary if your institution has a frozen section available so we've seen what is perfect we've seen the guideline negative ebus needs to go for a mediastinoscopy but how perfect is perfect so we saw in the aster trial that a combination of the two gives us a sensitivity of 94% but we still got it wrong in 9.6% after doing all this 7% still underwent futile thoracotomies people ended up paying more just to stage the mediastinum they ended up waiting more for their final curative intent surgery and to be honest with how many centers in india have an infrastructure that can give you ebus and mediastinoscopy just at the drop of a hat next question how feasible is perfect so forget india let's look at denmark okay and look at this paper which try to look at the adherence to these protocols in denmark the names that have circled again mr bosima makes a, a, a uh an arrival here along with anima the biggest names in invasive mediastinal staging and even in their center th this protocol this strict mediastinal staging protocol was adhered to only 19% of the patients ebus eus was an in initial staging in 43% and confirmatory mediastinoscopy was done only in 40% <laughs> this is in denmark where all healthcare is paid for all the facilities are paid for. how can we reproduce this in a country like india so like with everything else we need a temporary response so the way we prefer to do it is pick the bus when you think that the chance of your node coming positive is high so you do a less invasive procedure go in prove your node is positive and send your patient for systemic therapy but when on the pet scan you feel that the chances of the nodes coming positive are low it's best to go in and do a mediastinoscopy send the nodes for frozen they come negative proceed with surgery so this is the balance that we can find between the two procedures i'd like to conclude my talk by saying i would have said mom but after that last year i want to go as well there's no doubt about that it also helps you to prognosticate your patient so it is something that needs to be done diligently what you see is not always what you get on the pet scan so we know that invasive staging is a must there is no getting around that it is difficult to be perfect but in such a scenario it's best that we be wise and we choose between ebus and mediastinoscopy which works best for us and the patient as well thank you very much i'd be happy to take any questions